Legend has it that when Moses went up onto the mountain and received the Ten Commandments, that he received other wisdom from God and from the archangels that were present, that were instructing him. One of those gifts was the Kabbalah. And as legend has it, Moses was given the Kabbalah to help mankind converse with divinity, to provide a mechanism for which mankind could transcend from the earthly realm to the spiritual realm. And whether legends are true or not, that is where we will begin with what I consider one of the most cornerstone pieces of esotericism today, and certainly in my own life. I am the Desert Viking, an esoteric Freemason, and we will begin to explore the Kabbalah and the Tree of Life. Good to see everybody. Thank you for tuning in. This series on the Kabbalah, something that I've been waiting to do for a little while. Um, and the Kabbalah is one of the four cornerstones of my own study. So this is the Builder's Workshop. And the Builder's Workshop for me is nothing more than answering the question... I get a lot, which is essentially, what is an esoteric Freemason? What is esotericism in general? And how do I even begin? This is something that interests me, but there's so many books, there's so many things out there, I don't even know where to begin. And I can certainly empathize and sympathize because I was, at one point, in the same situation. In fact, I'd say I still am. I'd say most of us who study esotericism never lose that feeling that you're in the middle of an ocean and you're kind of just trying to keep your head above the water because there is a lot. And as there's a lot, there's a lot of truths and there's a lot of falsehoods. There's a lot of uh, shortcuts. And that's especially true with Kabbalah. So what I want to do, what I wanted to do with the Builder's Workshop was simply give you where I started my journey from. And not so that you can copy me. And you should never, ever try to imitate someone else. You have to find your own path. And esotericism, it is vital that you form your own path. Um, and that's, that's, that's something you have to get your mind around. Because what we often look for is a hidden recipe or just a plan, right? Like, tell me how to go from A to B to C, and I'll just do those things, and I will achieve what I set out to do. And esotericism doesn't work that way at all. You can get pointers and guides, but ultimately each one of us has to find our own version of the truth, which leads us to the same destination. And even the holy texts themselves, the Torah, the Old Testament, the Bible, whatever we want to call it, all the different holy texts out there. Ancient Hebrew and Greek and Coptic, these are our codified languages, are coded in that there is no literal, there is no straight road to any of these. So if you're translating, if you take three Greek scholars and you put them on a, on a text and say, translate this for me, you're going to get three very different translations. Now, I say very different. They're not going to be grotesquely different, or you'd hope not. But they're going to be different enough where they're going to be three bodies of work that all have similar ties, but are all approached in a different way, because Greek, like Hebrew, like Coptic, which is what a lot of these texts were written in, the words, the letters, have multiple meanings. The words have multiple meanings. And so what you're doing is you're seeing one... Uh, that person, the person who translated his or her interpretation of that body of work. And for me, this is personally why I'm studying Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, so that I can also read from the source texts 
and not have to rely on English. And I don't want to stray too far from Kabbalah, but these all, this, this path is still, it's general enough where those lessons have to be learned now. If you're just starting, or if you're not just starting, maybe you just need that reminder. There is no easy path, and um, translations are going to differ from point to point. As an example, um, the research group I'm a part of, which I will be talking about in the future, uh, one of our brothers is researching the Sefer Raziel. The Sefer Raziel was a book that used to be given as a, as a hidden book that was given to students of the Sefer Yetzira, which we're talking about some, some books now that you may not be familiar with, but the Sefer Yetzira is the foundation book of Kabbalah. It's the very first book um, that people will tell you to read. And Sefer Raziel was given after you've read the, the Sefer Yetzira. Now Raziel is the Archangel of Mysteries, so he's kind of like the esoteric Archangel. It's similar to Metatron, but not quite the same. And legend has it, Raziel, the angel gave Adam a book. And upon Adam's expulsion from the uh, Garden of Eden, Raziel gave him a book. And that book had the keys and the secrets of, of, of life, basically. And, and the angels were in an uproar over this. And uh, the book got thrown into the sea, but God rescued it because God, God forgave Raziel for this. Now, anyway, that all being a neat story, um, there uh, are one of our brothers has four versions of the Sefer Raziel in different languages, and he has translated them. And the four different versions he had all had, were four different, basically books. They were all rooted in the same thing, but they were four different books that were the Sefer Raziel because of the way the translations work. So, keep that in mind when you're dealing with esoteric books that were translated. Uh, you're dealing with someone's translation of it. That's a very key. Like, put that bullet point in your mind. That's why it's important to me to, to try to learn some of these ancient languages just to be able to review those. Now, all that being said, Kabbalah, Tree of Life, where did it really originate from? Like much of the mystery schools, no one can give you an articulated answer that is fact. I can't. And I always like to say in all of my videos, I am not a guru. I do not have all the answers. I am a student. I have a lot to learn. Um, so that being said, no one knows where Kabbalah originated from. You will have heated arguments over it. The legend is that Moses received it. Um, the first book that people, and I'm just going to show you some of my collection I've got, 15 books on the Kabbalah, but I'm going to show you like a starting point. This one is Sefer Yetzirah. Now, Sefer Yetzirah itself is a very small body of work, but it's very coded, riddled, and cryptic. So this book, this is a thicker book. It's a little bit of a mind, mind uh, bender, but this book is by, I, I can't pronounce his name, R.E.A. Kaplan. This was recommended to me by Timothy Hogan who did a lot of his Kabbalah work uh, in Freemasonry. His writings were based off of this book. So the Sefer Yetzirah was either written in the 2nd century or was written around the 12th or 13th century. No one knows which. The second book, the second Kabbalistic text that's very important, is the Zohar, the Book of Splendor. And this book was written roughly the 12th, 13th century-ish. It's the basis for a lot of Kabbalah. And again, these are books that are um, annotated by authors who are giving their thoughts as you're going along, which kind of help you along. So that's, that's what's good. You're going to find a lot of Sefer Yitzir and Zohar books out there that you can obtain. Um, those are the two that I, I use. Uh, you may have a different opinion, you may like something else. I may go out and, and like another Sefer Yitzhira book by a different author because he has a different perspective. And that's, that's very important. The differing perspectives is what helps you learn and grow. Now, that all being said, so because they were written down in, a, in either the 2nd century or 13th century, people assume that's when Kabbalah was invented because it was written down then. 
Now, no one can prove when it was written down. They just have a general idea. But here's the thing. And again, I'm not trying to spiel like I know the, the hidden secrets of Kabbalah and I'm a master, because I'm not. But I will tell you with the mystery schools, they did not write things down. The mystery schools were a verbal tradition. When you joined them, if you were allowed to join them, you were taught mostly verbally. So you had to memorize a lot. And you write stuff down. And what that means is just because the Sefer Yetzirah was written in the 2nd century, or the 13th century, does not mean that that's where it originated from. The body of work that composed those texts, in my mind, was likely a verbal tradition passed on for generations. And in fact, there are little breadcrumbs that you can read if you read some of the um, scholars of antiquity, such as Pythagoras, where shadows of the Kabbalah can be found in their writings and then in their, in their teachings. Um, so I believe that it's likely that it is a lot m older than what people want to say it is. There's just no written record to prove it. So, you know, it's one of those, if you can't prove it, all it will be will be speculation. Now, I'm not going to touch on any more book sources or anything in this video. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the thing that you see up there on my screen and what that is and why do we do it and why do we care. Why are you going to spend a lot of time learning the Kabbalah? As with anything in esotericism, there you're going to get differing opinions. Uh, I know a lot of people who dismiss the Kabbalah as complete nonsense. I know people that dismiss the Kabbalah saying it's a distraction and that people spend their lifetimes basically chasing after shadows and it's, it's, it's all for nothing. I know people who say that they acknowledge the usefulness of the Kabbalah or Kabbalah. I call it Kabbalah, but Kabbalah. Um, they will say it's useful, but they want to go a different route. And then there are people who will say that the Kabbalah is cornerstone to their life. So you're going to get a lot of different opinions. Like anything in esotericism, whether it is useful or not will be up to you. Now, it is true, you can chase shadows with anything here, with any 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 of the books you see in my great library behind me. You can chase shadows for a whole life, for many lives. So I don't disagree with that. But the teachings of the Kabbalah and the, the meditations and the philosophy around it, I think, are worth more than gold. They are... Once you get a good handle on them, one of the many master keys you will obtain to being able to unlock parts of you within yourselves and pieces of the labyrinth within yourself that you can't uh, access without. You don't need the Kabbalah to do that, but it is, like everything, a tool. It is a tool to help you get closer to the divine. It is a tool to get your mind in the correct space to try to access the divine. So I come at it like that. Now my first exposure to Kabbalah came when I was about 20 or 21 years old. I was still serving in the military. I had come home from Korea. In Korea, I had uh, experienced my first Eastern philosophy. I had been exposed to a Buddhist temple that was near base, and you had to climb the mountain to get to it. And from that, uh, up until that point, for about five years or so, I was about 15 when I started esoteric studies, like in earnest, I've been doing a lot of lower practices, and lower practices just mean like Druidism, that kind of thing, earth-based elementalism. I had been exposed not only to Eastern uh, thought and philosophy, which fascinates me and still does, because it's another way to get to the same place. But um, I was also exposed to my first bit of ceremonial magic, high magic, higher theurgy is what they call it. And theurgy is all about the great work and um, 
getting in contact with God and your your higher self. That's theurgy. A lot of Gnosticism deals with theurgy. Uh, mysticism deals with theurgy. Kabbalah, as you're seeing here, Kabbalah is the mystical branch of the Jewish faith. So that was my first exposure to Kabbalah was through uh, the Golden Dawn, because the Golden Dawn used a lot of Kabbalistic uh, theory and imagery and uh, in their practices. And I was always fascinated by this this thing, the Tree of Life, and, and what it could do, and what it was. So, to answer what does Kabbalah do for me, why do I bother working with this thing? Let's see if I can make this bigger. Nope, it doesn't want to be bigger. So... I apologize. Oh, there, here we go. All right, we're gonna obscure me a little bit. It is a, it is a, a an important uh, picture. It's an image. Understand that the tree of life that you're seeing right there that that's a common way you're gonna see it. That geometry right there. That is not the only way to view the Kabbalah. In fact, in the Sefer Yetzirah, the Kabbalah is depicted as uh, within a cube. The tree of life is just a very common way to demonstrate. The Sephir. And, um, but there are many, so you may see many uh, as you research this. Now, with Kabbalah, there are several ways that this is a useful um, construct. Number one being a, it's a piece of geometry. The geometry itself can be revealing. With the Kabbalah, there are ten sephira, or spheres, which you can count there, ten of them. There's also a hidden one, a hidden one, and that hidden one is located, I can't point to it, but it's between, it's at the top in that, in that big empty space there. And that's called da'at, which is, uh, some people say it shouldn't be there in the first place, other people say that it was intentionally put there and is useful Again, we're falling back on that old, in esotericism, you're going to have multiple opinions. But Da'at represents knowledge, and it sits across what's called the abyss, up at the top there. And that yellow sphere, going to the white sphere, the yellow sphere is Tifereth, and the white sphere is Kether, or Kether. And Tifereth represents basically the highest point a human can achieve. It's called the Christos, or the Christos or the Buddha, Jesus, etc. Those, those individuals reach that level of development. And upon that level, there's a veil that separates the yellow between the white sphere, which is Kether, and, and you have to cross the abyss, figuratively. And maybe literally, maybe if you think about it from a soul journey perspective. But there are 10 Sephiroth, plus the uh, hidden 11. And there are 22 paths you can see the, all the connections there. There are 22 connections. So if you add those up, that means without the hidden, there are 32. They call them the 32 paths of wisdom. And if you add the hidden one, there's th there are 33. So that number 32 and 33 come up quite a bit in many different mystery schools. For Freemasonry, we know that there are uh, 32 working degrees of the Scottish Rite, plus the one honorable degree, which is the 33rd degree. Now, with the Tree of Life, we can see that, and we're going to talk about how we use this in a minute, but I'm, I'm kind of going over the structure for you in this video. I'm not going to go over what each one of these does. I want to try to keep this video sane and, and not super long, but these are structured along three pillars. Now, the leftmost pillar is the pillar of severity or strength. And if you view this pillar, if you, if you view this as if you were a person and your back was to the tree of life, then the pillar of severity would be on your right. And if you're in Freemasonry, there is a, uh, well, there's a certain, there's a certain thing you may, you may recognize dealing with uh, the direction there. And that's all I'll really say but that points to the first pillar of severity. The pillar on the right of this image, 
which would be to the left if your your left if your back was to this is the pillar of beauty. Now those two pillars have many several, maybe not many, but several different names throughout different traditions. In the Bible it's got uh, certain names. Um but you'll see it named those you'll see them named differently. And then we have the middle pillar. And the middle pillar is the pillar of equilibrium. And in the pillar of equilibrium, we are supposed to try to uh, strive for balance between those two things. And that's what's important about those, two, about those three pillars. The middle pillar is, is you walking between two extreme forces. And with those two extreme forces, they are constantly pulling against each other, and they're creating a tension, which is the third. And that tension's important. You need that tension. Because if one or the other of those sides is weak, you lose tension. If you lose tension, that's what makes up the structure of the universe, basically, is that, that tensile energy. Think about like a net. A net is anchored on two ends, and it's pulled tight and you're able to walk across the net. If one of those sides is weaker than the other, uh, you won't be able to walk across it very easily, or it'll just collapse. And that's the first lesson I will give you about the Kabbalah, is that your life is going to be made up of struggles, tensions, opposing forces, and we have to strive to do our best to remain in the middle between severity and beauty, strength, and love. So you'll see that. And you see this picture is also divided into four trees of life. You see a red, a blue, a yellow, and a green. Or hopefully you see it. If you can't see colors, well, the top is red, then blue, then yellow, then green. And it's because the Kabbalah is said to reside within four worlds. And there are actually five worlds. There's a hidden world, the fifth world of spirit. Now, each of those worlds is representative of an element on the material plane, which is the plane we live on. So the very topmost element being red, if you can guess, that's the element of fire. And that's Atsuluth. Underneath that, the blue one is Bria, or Berea. And I probably messed these names up because... They're not in my native language, so I apologize, and someone will let me know that I got the name wrong, but it's Berea. This is the realm of uh, creation. This is where the archangels are said to dwell. Underneath that, the yellow, gold color, that is Yetzirah, foundation. And Yetzirah is where the angelic choirs live and dwell. And there's the book, Sefer Yetzirah, the book of foundation, the book of creation. And underneath that, the green one, that that is Asira. Got that name wrong probably as well. But that is the representative of the element of earth. And the fifth hidden world is spirit. And so when we look at like sacred geometry and we see pentagram, pentagrams represent the four elements plus the fifth spirit. And if you're a Freemason, you'll see that sacred geometry within your lodge. It's there. Every one of our degrees represents an element. So the tree of life dwells on multiple worlds, which means we have multiple trees of life. Now, hermetic wisdom and hermetic philosophy teaches us as above, so below. What that means here is that this is the tree of life on which we have angelic choirs and the archangels and the divine. And at the very bottom we have the material plane. And indeed, as above, so below, which means there is a tree going below, which is the tree of death. And the tree of death is where all of our demons and devils live. And here's the deal. We just talked about the three pillars in balance. As above, so below. You can't just focus on one. 
You have to have knowledge of both. You have to be able to master both. You can't just hide from one. And that's another important lesson that the Kabbalah has taught me. Now, in this series, I'm not focusing on the tree of death. We're not going to even mess with it. We don't need to at this, at this stage. Just be aware that it exists. There is one. And every, every force you see going in one direction will have an opposing force beneath it. And that the key I want you to take away from here is balance. Not only do you have to balance the two pillars pulling against you, you have to balance the two forces up and down. That is part of our journey. Now everything here is done up in Hebrew. So every time that it's kind of hard to see in that video or that vision. But all of those are done up in Hebrew. And the three Hebrew letters we have up at the top representing the three pillars are the three mother letters of the Hebrew uh, alphabet. So another reason why I find it kind of important to understand at least what the Hebrew letters are and, and what they do. Because Hebrew is steeped in everything in Kabbalah, it being Jewish mysticism and all, is to be expected. Now the tree has 22 paths, 32 if you count the sephir, the 32 paths of wisdom, plus one for the dot, for dot, the knowledge. Each of those pieces of geometry there has something to teach you. The paths between two sephiroth are a combination of the two spheres that they connect. Now, there are 22 letters in the ancient Hebrew biblical alphabet, and there are 22 paths. And you will see Hebrew letters attached to each path. And each Hebrew letter has a meaning, has several meanings packed into it. Not only Hebrew, Hebrew as a coded language has its visual representation, number one, and that visual representation is packed with data. It's packed with what that represents. The second piece of, of, of a Hebrew uh, character is how it's vibrated, its sound. Its third piece of information is the mathematical value that it holds. So all of that being said, each path, each path, the lines, have a Hebrew letter associated with it. Now, the trick is, you're going to look for it being always a certain way, meaning Certain paths should always have certain letters, you would think, because you're going to be taught that way, and that's not correct. There are multiple layouts of the tree of life in terms of where the letters go. And that's something that's driven me bonkers as well. Um, something I consider is maybe it's up to us to place the letters on those paths as they speak to us and that we have our own tree of life, because as within, so without, more hermeticism, the tree of life is within you, but you are also outside part of the tree of life. Which, in, which means each individual tree of life within you is going to be unique compared to uh, someone else's. Well, maybe not unique. There's only so many combinations, but you get the idea. It may not be the same as someone else. That's another fascinating part of its study. Each of the Sephiroth is named after a Hebrew word, so you'll see Hebrew for the words, and they have meanings. Another thing to point out with Hebrew is dialect differences. And what that means is if you're picking up different books, you will see, likely, uh, depending on how old the book is you're reading, uh, the older books, they use a different dialect. So what that means is like Kether, Keter at the top, K-E-T-H-E-R, Kether. Some will call it Kesser, and that's because the way that that particular letter was pronounced in that dialect was to remove the the part and replace it with an S. So when you translate it to English, the two words are going to be different technically, but they mean the same thing. Something to just keep in mind. There's different dialects. Most modern writers are going to use the modern version of, of the Hebrew dialect, but there are several, especially as you get into older, like early 20th century and before, they're, they're going to be using uh, the older dialects, and sometimes they flip back and forth between the two within one book. So you'll see an author refer to Kesser and Kether in the same text. So that can be kind of confusing. Just, just be aware that that's a thing as well. So I'm going to wrap this video up with the three, the three uses of the Kabbalah, and we'll get into 
more of these. Uh, I want to focus on more of these as we move in. But um, so 22 letters go on to the 22 paths. Seven of the planets uh, direct the, the Sephira, the ancient seven planets. There are archangels associated with each of those Sephira. There's angelic choirs associated with them. There's colors associated with each of those, which come from math. The vibrations, the sound they make, and the, the frequency of the wavelength is the color. And um, things like the tarot help. The, there are 22 major arcana cards, for example, that also match up to the, to the Tree of Life. And the 10 uh, Sephiroth ha are matched up to the ace through the 10 on the tarot deck. And there are four suits in a tarot deck for the four worlds that you're seeing there. So, for example, wands represents fire. So the four of wands would represent the fourth Sephira, number four, which is um, number four would be Gabura, which is strength. It's the red one. That would be if it was wand, then that would be Gabura in its fire world aspect, which has meaning, right? So tarot can play a role in Kabbalah, and in fact, I use it, I use tarot for that reason. It helps me navigate the tree of life, not for as a divination tool, but as a, a way to help me understand the tree of life. Now, the three ap uh, applications of Kabbalah, what we're going to be focusing you know, on this channel mainly is going to be number one, the first use, and that is philosophical. The philosophical applications of Kabbalah are immense, and in it, you begin to recognize actions in your life, verbs, and how they react or relate to the sephira, the, the spheres, or and or the paths that connect to other spheres. And you will recognize, once you've studied this long enough, what path you're currently on or what you're dealing with. And you can look to the Kabbalah for wisdom. Which leads us to the second use, which is similar to the first, and that's meditation. Meditation on the Kabbalah lets you focus on an area of the tree of life and how it resounds with you and, and your current journey, among other things. And the third use of Kabbalah is practical application, which many will say is forbidden. And um, we're not going to really get into that on this channel, what the practical applications of Kabbalah are. Um, there is, I will say, any anything dealing with esoterics that you want to use in a practical manner, and we're talking about woo-woo, has dangers, and you need to be aware of those dangers and not be foolish and uh, step into things that you're not ready for because it can cause everlasting damage. So there's a lot of power with the Kabbalah, but that comes with a risk and a cost. So we're not going to deal with that on this. We're just going to deal mainly with the, the, the philosophy and the meditation aspect of it because those by themselves are cornerstones to me. And this is a workers builder's workshop where I'm explaining how I got on my path and how this worked for me. Now, you can take this information and you can go off in your own rabbit hole and, you, you, and you're going to find things that I didn't even know about and vice versa. That's the beauty of all of this. And so, as with anything, I would love to hear any thoughts you may have on what you find or what you may know. So this is about a 30-minute video on just a primer of Kabbalah and what it is and what we're going to be talking about over the next few uh, episodes when we start breaking the Kabbalah down. And I'm also going to be including some articles that I've written um, involving esoteric Freemasonry and how they relate to me in the degree work that I did, my own personal journey. So I'm looking forward to that. If you have any comments, please uh, give them in the comment section. Uh, if you have any, you know, if you liked it, give me a like, subscribe. Uh, if you like this kind of content, I enjoy putting it out. And until next time, it is now summer, and it's summer in the desert, which means it's very warm. So stay cool, and we'll see what the summer has to bring for us. I'll talk to you soon.